JBN, we keep you informed. Businessman and Italian wife murdered in Negril. A Negril Westmoreland businessman and his Italian wife were yesterday morning shot dead during apparent burglary and robbery at their western premises in the resort town. Westmoreland is one of three western parishes now under a state of public emergency. The deceased have been identified as 49-year-old Osborne Richards and 45-year-old Patricia Richards. It is reported that unknown assailants barged in on them about 12.35 a.m. They were both shot and killed. Police reports indicate that the hands of both victims were bound with an electrical cord and a piece of fabric. The house was ransacked and a refrigerator was missing. The killings have left residents and business interests in the West End, the hub of the town's tourism, shocked. Things were really bad at the start of the year, with a number of murders, but things got quiet after the state of emergency was imposed, a West End businessman said. We are steadily killing the golden goose, so we might soon find ourselves without any eggs, he said, referring to tourism, the mainstay of the Negril economy. Between January 1 and November 9, Westmoreland recorded 72 murders. Teacher remanded on charges of having sex with underage students. A teacher is employed to a school in St. Elizabeth who was charged for alleged sexual offenses involving students at the institution where he works was remanded in custody at his first court appearance earlier this week. The accused, 24-year-old Noel Tracy, was slapped with three counts of having sexual intercourse with a person under the age of 16 years. He appeared in the St. Elizabeth Parish Court on Tuesday and was ordered to remain in the custody of the police until December 9. At that time, a bail application is expected to be made on his behalf. It is alleged that investigators from the Center for the Investigation of Sexual Offenses and Child Abuse, Sissoka, received complaints alleging that the teacher sexually assaulted a number of students at the school in question. Following a probe by the police, the educator was taken into custody and subsequently charged. 18-year-old girl on firearm charges granted bail. The 18-year-old female was arrested and charged in relation to a shooting incident in Almond Town, Kingston on October 29 was yesterday morning granted bail. Alia Basco was charged with shooting with intent and illegal possession of a gun. According to the Constabulary's Corporate Communication Unit, CCU, Basco is from Stephen Street, also in Almond Town, is accused of orchestrating the shooting injury of a man with whom she allegedly had an altercation. Lawmen say she was caught by the Kingston Central Police on Sunday, November 3, after initially escaping from the scene of the incident at Eero Circle. She was charged following an interview with her attorney. When the matter was called up in the Kingston and St. Andrew Parish Court yesterday morning, Basco was offered $100,000 bail with one or three sureties, following a successful bail application by her attorney, Kimberly Whitaker. Basco is expected to return to court on December 16. As part of her bail condition, Basco is not to interfere with the witness in the case. A stop order was also put in place. Woman's sudden death shocks family. A month after Dahima Vanet Wilson died unexpectedly, her sister requested an autopsy by a private doctor. She died on October 18, the same day family members rushed her to the hospital. The autopsy found that Dahima, who had four children, including the baby she had in late September, died from blood poisoning due to the presence of placenta, widely referred to as afterbirth, that was left in her body. The report said that Wilson also developed a respiratory tract infection. Tessa Wilson, Dahima's sister, is distraught. It's really sad. When they called me and told my sister that it was heartbreaking. Who's going to take you after the young baby? The kids need answers too. When that baby asks, where's mommy? What if you tell him? She said. When I did the autopsy, I didn't go back to the hospital or say anything about it because I was busy with the funeral. I was planning to go to the hospital after the funeral, she added. Dr. Gerald Smith, who performed the autopsy on November 15, says the hospital is not able to tell up front if all the placenta is removed. Sometimes it comes out in pieces, and Jamaica is not at the point where you ultrasound every womb. We don't have that kind of resources, and that is perhaps the only way you can look inside the womb to know if products of conception or none of the placenta is still stuck inside, the doctor said. Tessa said that when her sister just had the baby, she thought she had the flu, so she didn't seek medical attention. She just thought she was sick. She never had any problem with any of her kids, she said. Dahima was admitted to the Victoria Jubilee Hospital on Monday, September 29, 
and gave birth naturally the same day. She was discharged that weekend. We buried her mother four years now. Now me have to come here and bury she, and she had the only baby sister me have, said Tessa. Kathleen Cooper Brown, CEO of the VJH, said that she is not aware of the issue. I am not in a position to give you details on that. That is a medical matter. I don't know of the case either, she said. I would have to do some investigation. They should come to us and let us know how they feel. Injured Fogger recounts frightful attack in Trenchdown as screws come under fire in dengue fight. Even as the government ramps up its war against dengue fever by deploying fogging crews and home inspection teams, vector-controlled field workers have been the casualty of 21 violent attacks in four parishes this year. Personnel have also escaped injury in numerous other incidents. The central Jamaica parish of St. Catherine has been the epicenter of the hostilities, with health ministry commissioned personnel suffering injuries in 15 cases. There have been four attacks in Kingston and St. Andrew, and one each in St. Mary and Westmoreland. Opposition has been most aggressive in low-income inner-city communities, as streets are transformed into battlegrounds with stones, the choice missile of angry residents. Fogging, the dispensing of toxic chemical solutions that kill the Aedes aegypti mosquito, but which poses no danger to householders, has been a key weapon in the arsenal of the authorities on the front line against dengue, which has caused at least 46 confirmed or suspected deaths in 2019 and 17 last year. Most of the cases, the minister said, involved children below 14 years old. Children and the elderly are the most vulnerable cohorts. Duane Solomon is the latest victim of a stone attack that took place in Trenchtown on Wednesday. Crew men were conducting a fogging exercise in the South St. Andrew inner city neighborhood when they came under fire as stone throwers took aim. When we were coming back up, we started fogging and doing that exercise with just the stones that come through the smoke at us. One hit me on my left arm and then the next two jumping at the vehicle, Solomon said on Thursday afternoon. We knocked the vehicle indicating to the driver that he need to drive up a little faster to, to come out of that vicinity. We don't know if more could come and lick in our head or anything like that. Solomon, stunned with pain, was forced to seek medical attention for injuries to his hand. He has not been back on the job since he got hurt, as he has been ordered by a doctor to get rest and continue to receive treatment to prevent further swelling. He has also made an official report to the police. We did an assessment to ensure that nobody else was hit and the vehicle was not damaged. I asked the team leader to take me to the comprehensive health center because I was feeling some pain and then contact my supervisor and the staff to let them know what was happening. This is the second time that Solomon has come under attack while carrying out vector control duties. The first was in the malaria time in the Fletcher's Land area, but this is the first time this year for me, he said. Solomon says that he personally knows other co-workers who have sustained injuries at the hands of stone throwers, including one who was struck on the eye in the western St. Andrew inner city of Waterhouse. He got a couple of stitches. That was last month, he said. Solomon explained that foggers and other inspection crews operate in grave fear, uncertain when they might be set upon by agitated residents. He also disclosed that fogging operations were often cut short or abandoned altogether, putting all soldiers at greater risk of contacting dengue fever in mosquito-friendly habitats. You cannot make a determination we're going to fling stone upon you. Some person will accept us in the community and okay with us with what we're doing. But some persons will signal us and tell us that we don't need to write this up. And based on protocol from the office, we don't do it. The residents are first priority. And so if there's something happening and they say no, we should move from this up. Other foggers were arrested on Thursday, demanding that the ministry intervene to protect them. The health ministry expressed outrage at the hostility its field personnel faced, with the government gearing up to intensify mitigation measures with $1 billion cleanup drive set to begin. Again, even while we recognize the threat to all of us, we still have cases where persons are being negatively responded to in communities. I want to appeal to Jamaicans to recognize the importance of the vector workers. Give them access and listen to them because they are trained in order to provide some guidance, said Health and Wellness Minister Christopher Tufton during a press briefing at the ministry's New Kingston offices on Thursday. Tufton warned that the perpetrators of attacks on vector control workers would be prosecuted. Meanwhile, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Jacqueline Bissese McKenzie reported that since August, there has been a rise in the intensity and volume of dengue cases in western Jamaica.
particularly St. James, Hanover, Trelawney and Westmoreland, as well as the non-central parish of St. Anne. Falmouth Business Operators Floating Scandal Ban Several business operators in Falmouth, Trelawney appear to be flouting the government's ban on single-use plastic bags, which are widely being used in the market and supermarkets. At the start of the year, the government imposed a ban on the importation, manufacturing, distribution and use of all single-use plastic carrier bags, commonly called scandal bags, smaller than 24 inches by 24 inches, except those utilized to maintain public health or food safety standards. Cabinet Minister Darrell Vaz, who is leading the fight against single-use plastics, had said that the government would also be going after persons who try to circumvent the ban by shaving or adding an inch or two to the bag sizes. However, on Sunday, a Chinese supermarket operator in Falmouth, conducting trade in defense of the prohibition order. In fact, the bags being distributed make a mockery of the ban, as they carried an inscription that reads, in part, I am a reusable shopping bag. This bag is enough size for government regulations. When the bags were closely inspected, it was noticed that except for the inscription and a smiley face, it was the same outlawed bags which have been deemed an environmental nuisance. Chulone Chamber of Commerce President Delroy Christie said he has heard reports of the continued widespread use of the plastic bags in Falmouth, but said he had not seen any. He have heard that some supermarkets have them, Christie said, adding that he believes it could take some time before the plastic bags disappear from the system completely. When quizzed as to whether or not the Chulone Chamber of Commerce had taken any steps to get its members to desist from selling and distributing the bags, Christie said the matter had been discussed. We really haven't gone overboard, but we talked about it. I think everybody understands the importance of that obeying the ban. Because when we have a beach cleanup, they would have seen the amount of plastic that turned up, said Christie. The National Environment and Planning Agency, whose mandate spans environmental protection, announced earlier this month that it was taking on enforcement and would be targeting offenders in central and western Jamaica. Since the ban on the use of single-use plastic bags, at least 16 individuals and businesses have been charged under the Trade Plastic Packaging Materials Prohibition Order 2018. A Montego Bay businessman was given the maximum fine of $2 million or up to two years in prison after he was found with some 600 boxes of the banned plastic bags. JBN, we keep you informed. Please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave us a comment and click the notification bell to receive our daily news items.